In his excellent 1998 book on the Scotch, Grandmaster Peter Wells famously described this opening as an idea leading to a rich strategic imbalance. Gary Kasparov went further when he stated that, apart from the Rai Lopez, in his opinion, the Scotch is the only opening after 1-E4-E5 E4, E5 to offer White any serious winning chances at all. Now certainly Kasparov has always been willing to back up those words with action, because in over 20 games using the Scotch he's yet to lose, racking up point after point in devastating attacking style. He seems to find new ideas and novelties in every line, forcing play, bemusing even the strongest of opponents with these innovations. Therefore the Scotch seems a perfect vehicle for his demonic energy and phenomenal chess talent. Now, thanks to this exclusive patronage, the Scotch enjoys great popularity at all levels of chess, and this popularity looks set to continue. It's a complex, fascinating opening, which almost always produces an interesting game. Before we look at his great games, I just want to kick around a few ideas with you to show you the basic aims and aspirations of the, the Scotch game. And um, let's just get to the basic position. So white plays e4, black e5, knight f3, knight c6. And now here comes d4, opening up the centre. e takes d4, and now knight takes d4. And I think we can see already that white has a very slight advantage in this position based uh, around the pawn at e4. It's a strong central dominant pawn controlling the d5 square. White hopes that, you know, under cover of this strong pawn, he's going to be able to develop his pieces aggressively and get onto the attack. However, Black must do his utmost to counter this, um, this idea, and Black responds usually very energetically in the Scotch, leading to very strange positions, where both players are put onto their metal early, trying to find the best squares for their pieces. Let me just show you one of the main lines very quickly. Um, let's say Black plays Knight f6, white takes on c6, damaging black's pawn structure. Black doesn't want the queens off at this stage, so b takes c6. e5, there we are, that's the first disruptive move. And now black plays a slightly unnatural move, queen to e7, blocking in the bishop on f8. And white responds with queen to e2, again blocking in his bishop. Black plays knight d5, this is one of the main lines by the way. And white plays c4, leading to what I consider to be a very odd position. White has problems with his bishop on f1, and his slightly loose pawn structure. For instance, how strong is that pawn on e5? It might inhibit the, the black pieces, it might be very weak, we don't know yet. Meanwhile, black has both of his bishops to think about, and the knight on d5 looks a bit exposed, added to which black's got a slightly strangely positioned queen. So a very odd positional round, typical of the positional scotch. Another example typical of the strange positions that can arise uh, in the early uh, opening occurs after e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, d4, e takes d4, knight takes d4, and then now the classical main line, bishop to c5. Well, before Kasparov came onto the scene and started baffling his opponents with his strange ideas, White would normally play knight b3 in this position. But Kasparov showed that knight takes c6 might well be quite a promising move for White. Hitherto, this move had thought to be completely innocuous because of Black's reply, queen to f6. But now Kasparov came out with another very strange move, queen to d2. That is his trademark. OK, d takes c6, knight c3, bishop e6, and now knight to a4. And I remember the first time this move was played against Nigel Short in the Savoy Theatre, London, 1993. And it caused almost consternation um, among the audience and the watching masters. Nobody could really work out what Kasparov was really doing. You know, first he plays a very quiet line, then he moves his knight to the side. But looking more closely... Kasparov is placing top priority on hindering Black's natural development of his pieces. That is a theme that runs through the Scotch. 
from top to bottom really. Non-standard moves such as knight a4 are actually quite common in the Scotch. Kasparov is trying to set up a position where the better player has every chance of outplaying his opponent. That is his aim. And certainly Black's got very unusual problems to solve after knight a4. For instance, play may proceed, rook d8, bishop d3, bishop d4, castles. And I would say both sides have problems in this position. Of course, the biggest drawback about this position for black is the pawn structure. Because white has actually set up a winning pawn structure along the lines of the exchange Ray Lopez. For instance, if we sweep all the pieces from the board and just leave kings and pawns, this is an identical pawn structure to the exchange Spanish, which is known to be losing for black. The four white pawns on the king side constitute a majority and can create a passed pawn, whereas the four to three majority for black on the queen side is going nowhere. Hello, I'm International Master Andrew Martin and welcome to this Foxy Openings DVD on the Scotch. Now the Scotch opening has been very popular at the highest level of world chess since the late 1980s when Gary Kasparov reintroduced this venerable opening at that level for his matches against Anatoly Karpov. I would say these days it's the second most popular open game after the Ray Lopez from White's point of view and results would tend to justify this popularity. I think that the Scotch is relatively easy to learn and understand and I've constructed a thoroughly modern repertoire for you on this DVD. So let's get to it, it's time to begin our examination. I think you will enjoy researching the Scotch with me. Well let us delve in to uh, the main lines of the Scotch now and the first idea I'm going to take you through is one of Black's most common fourth move alternatives and that's Bishop C5. This is one of Black's best moves as well. It's commonly employed at all levels um, and it's popular at Grandmaster level too. So that speaks volumes for the uh, validity of Black's approach. Basically Black just develops very straightforwardly and attacks the Knight on D4 forcing a slight concession. And if White isn't going to end up with absolutely nothing from the opening then he has to play very precisely indeed. Now there are several moves for white in this position. Um, the old fashioned move was knight b3. That's not the move I'm going to recommend to you here. But it is still a decent approach, especially at club level. Some very obscure positions can be reached in this line. But you know, I just don't like that position of the knight on b3. It's a personal thing. Um, white struggles to make use of that knight in virtually all the middle games that arise out of this system. Then comes bishop e3. Again, an old-fashioned move, but very modern in a sense. Uh, one of the most recent games I seem to recall seeing in the Scotch featured Magnus Carlsen beating Peter Laco with precisely this move. Grandmaster Sveshnikov liked this move. It was one of his favourites, and he used it frequently. So not a variation to be sneezed at, but nevertheless, not my recommendation here. There's also Knight F5, a very obscure move which Grandmaster Jan Timmen from the Netherlands has used on occasion with success but there are just too many ways for black to get a good move against knight f5 in my view. So that leaves a move which uh, has been considered innocuous for a long long time since the end of the 19th century in fact but which was revived by Gary Kasparov and I, I, I recall him using this move to particular effect in his World Championship match against Nigel Short in 1993. Um, and it's the move I'm going to recommend to you here. But with a modern twist. Not necessarily the way uh, Kasparov played it. Now knight takes c6. Well it's known that queen f6 is supposed to be the move for black. Black avoids any damage to the pawn structure. In view of a double attack against the knight on c6. And the pawn at f2. So the idea is when white defends f2. Black will take back with the queen on c6. Well, Kasparov showed that, uh, you know, Black still might have some problems in this position. Um, and a lot of the problems were associated with 
White being able to push his kingside pawns at the right moment and cramp black. However, an even more modern way to play the position is queen f3. And this is the move I'm going to recommend to you uh, on this DVD. I believe it's a move which is going to cause your opponents um, a lot of surprise. Uh, it's a very unusual move in the sense that it seems completely innocuous for white to offer the exchange of queens in this position. But the first point, of course, is that when black exchanges queens on f3, white recaptures. Black, let's say, takes on uh, c6. Well, white has reached a very favourable pawn structure. Uh, in a similar vein to the exchange variation of the Spanish. Whereas white's pawn majority on the king side can actually create a passed pawn, black's majority on the queen side is crippled. Black cannot create a passed pawn um, with this pawn majority, however hard he tries if white plays perfectly. So, of course, this position is completely different to the Ray Lopez exchange. Uh, although it's the same pawn structure, because white hasn't had to give up the bishop pair either. So white has at least a small nagging edge in this position, and it's very clear what white has got to play for, the favourable endgame. So going back to queen f3, we'll have to start our investigation with b takes c6. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this E4 repertoire DVD, where I'm going to be suggesting some interesting continuations for white, with which I hope you can surprise even really strong opponents. We're going to take a look at all of black's major responses to the king's pawn, and at the end of the DVD, you should have assembled a decent repertoire together. Now, where better to start than with the classical move E5? We need something good against this. In general, e5 and the Sicilian defence, c5, are encountered most often at all levels. And there's a jolly good reason for this. They dissuade white from playing d4, taking the centre. Yet this is going to be my precise recommendation. I'm going to suggest that you play d4 in this position. And after e takes d4, which is more or less forced from black's perspective, then we're going to surprise our opponents by playing knight f3. The core of this e4, e5 repertoire is going to be the scotch. But we have found quite a tricky move order to get into our favoured opening. And the idea of playing this way is to fight against Petrov's defence. Well now we come on to what is going to be a very important section of this DVD. Namely, what is White going to play against the Sicilian defence? Um, I hope I've covered e5 in some detail. Now we have to look at c5, which is black's sharpest move against 1e4. And um, it's clear that if you've got a lot of time for study, you've got a desire for research, then you should play the main lines. They're probably best. But for the average player, I'm not so sure this is best. I think a club player could easily get confused in a lot of the complicated main lines and go wrong. And in particular, I'm a, bit, um, I'm a bit unsure that playing the main lines isn't just going into the opponent's favourite area, which is something I'm loath to do. Instead, we should be looking to turn the tables and draw the opponent into something we've studied, and they haven't. So accordingly, I'm going to recommend the move B3 for you on this DVD. This is an unusual move. Uh, it's very interesting, and I think it will come as a complete surprise to most of your opponents. If you study the game's and ideas I'm going to recommend on this DVD, then you should be in good shape against the Sicilian defence. Now, in fact, over time, many grandmasters have used this continuation, and none more so than Tamas Gelashvili. He's been using B3 in the modern era to win lots of games as a practical weapon. And we're going to follow quite a few of this, his games on the DVD, because I think this idea of uh, following a grandmaster's repertoire just to save time, is a really good one. I mean, he's winning loads of games with it. Just study his games, and then you should be able to play it. That's the, the idea. 
So my first game comes to the Philadelphia Open, played in uh, April 2012. Gilashvili is white. He's a grandmaster, graded 2619 at the moment. And he's playing uh, Ortiz Aguirre, whose grade is 2255. And against B3, black played E6. There are quite a few things that black can do. We'll look at E6 first. And after that, Gilashvili played knight F3, D6, and then bishop B2. So if white's development in, isn't interrupted, this is the basic idea. Black went knight f6, attacking the pawn, and now an immediate surprise for black, e5. In the Sicilian defence, where black is usually getting ready to rattle off lots of moves, a disruptive move like this, early in the game, can often cause confusion. Well, Ortiz took the pawn, white recaptured with the knight. Black played bishop e7, getting ready to castle. And now another unorthodox move, queen f3. I think when you play this variation, you have to get ready to play in a slightly unorthodox fashion. Queen f3, however, is a very interesting move. You quite often see white transferring his queen to the king side um, in the Sicilian defence. And particularly here, as black is getting ready to castle, that queen could easily slide across to either g3 or h3. Um, as circumstances demand. And where she sits, she's actually stopping black from expanding on the queen side. So, a useful developing move uh, in all circumstances. Hi, International Grandmaster Ron W. Henley, and today, in this video series, we are going to look at the Scotch game. We will try to design a complete opening system for white. In some cases where I don't cover the variations, I will give you a pointer in what direction to take. Our system will be based around 1, e4, e5, black's most solid classical response. We will play 2, knight f3, attacking the pawn on e5, and after knight c6, again black's most common response, we will play 3, d4. That leads us to the Scotch game. In 1750, Ercole del Rio mentioned the opening moves in his treatise on the game of chess, Practical Observations. The opening received its name from a correspondence game in 1824 between London and Edinburgh. The Scotch game was briefly popular in the 19th century, but by 1900 it kind of lost favor among top players because it was thought to release the central tension a bit too early and allow black to equalize without difficulty. One of the very first games ever, and the game that the quote, Scotch game derives its name from, came when the city of Nottingham played the city of Cambridge in 1820. Let's take a look. E4, E5, knight out, knight out, and D4. That is the pure Scotch game. Pawn takes, knight takes, and then, not one of the main moves, but a move that I see quite often when I'm teaching my students to play is knight takes knight. So, of course, we have to play queen takes, and now black has a number of options. In this game, black plays queen f6, offers to trade queens. White plays e5. Very good, fighting for the initiative. Black plays queen g6. And we can see this is a bit dubious because he actually kind of loses time. So after knight c3, they now change their mind and play queen b6. Which, of course, begins the obvious question. If you're going to play queen b6 and offer to trade queens, why not have done it last move? But again, 1820. This is one of the very first games in Scotch defense. Uh, both sides are a bit on their own. White shows he's not afraid to trade queens and inflict a little damage on the black queen side pawns. And now, because he has this extra tempo, he's able to follow with knight to b5. You can see the knight on b5 immediately exploits the weakness of the c7 pawn. So in fact, the only piece in the black hand is the king that can come over to defend. And now, white simply plays bishop f4, continuing with his development. And sometimes I ask my students, how many pieces does white have out? The answer here would be two. How many pieces does black have out? Well, he's still working on that. So let's take a look, another pawn move. And here, I like what white does, very committal. He plays knight into d6, and after bishop takes, pawn takes, the pawn on d6 is dual edge. Okay, it's a bit extended, but also it's very restricting on the black position. Knight comes out, bishop comes out to c4. So at this point, I think that we can see that with the two bishops, white has clearly had a successful opening. 
You notice the bishop on c4 is already attacking the pawn on f7. At this point, we can definitely say the opening has been a success for white. Two bishops, more space, slight lead in development. Black plays rook f8. White plays bishop e3. There we can see he's touching the pawn on b6. Black plays c5 to block the attack. And now the simple f3, cutting down options for the black knight. Knight goes to e8, attacking the pawn. Castles, continuing development, defending the pawn. Black plays f5, and now bishop to g5 check. White plays knight f6, and now interesting move. I would be inclined to simply play rook at hd1. Rooks belong on open files, not too complicated. Team playing white, Nottingham, played b4, which is an interesting move. Obviously looking to attack this pawn complex. And if black were to take, I think what they had in mind here, was that they were simply going to play bishop back to e3, and black is under severe pressure. In the game, after b4, h6. This, of course, attacks the bishop. Bishop comes back to e3. Rook goes to a4. And now a little quiet move, c3. This obviously protects the pawn. Here, he's trying to hold white up by pinning the pawn on b4. White simply plays c3, and after knight e8, c3. That stops the advance of the f pawn. Also possible is king b2, f4, bishop back, rook up, king up, and pawn takes pawn with a winning game for white. After g3, black played rook f6, hoping to surround the pawn on e5, but then came bishop f4, pawn takes, bishop e5, and after pawn takes, Bishop takes check, winning the exchange. After knight takes, bishop f7. White has a winning game at this point. A large part of black's problem here is that he never really did solve the problem of how to complete his development. After b5, rook at hd1, b6, hoping to emerge with the bishop, rook e7, bishop a6, bishop back to b3, gaining the vital tempo, and attacking the pawn on g7, rook a5, and Rook takes g7. The city of Cambridge felt obligated to resign at this point because, in fact, they are five points down, according to Fritz. So, a very excellent early example of black failing to take strong countermeasures and just letting white kind of have his way with the lead in development. In the 1990s, the 13th World Champion resurrected the Scotch game as a surprise weapon in his World Championship match with... So before we look at the main line theory, we're going to look at some early black alternatives. And among these four, dot dot dot, knight takes d4 by black, I find to be a fairly frequent occurrence at the uh, lower level. A lot of times lower rated players can't stand the tension of this piece can take that piece or that piece can take this piece, and so they simply exchange and don't have to worry about it. However, after four knight takes d4, queen takes d4, White has more space, he's got his pawn on e4, he's got his queen on d4 where it's not easy for black to exploit, and he's got a little bit, a uh, little bit of an edge in space and time. First game we're going to look at in that respect is Daniel Tempora versus Alvarez, played in Spain, 1999, crushing attack and a white victory in 23 moves. We'll look at Strakovic versus Tejero, played 1992, another win in 36 moves. Then we'll look at a game where the famous Victor Korchnoi, four-time Soviet champion and world championship challenger, plays against Hartoglu in a Greece simul, and ultimately he won, but we're only going to look at the first 28 moves where he built up the position nicely and could have had a clear, comfortable, solid advantage. Then we're going to look at Mario versus Shilin, 1-0 in 24 moves, played in Odessa 2007, 
Then we will look at another game, Hachard versus Lebanese. That was played in Belgium 2005, and that ended in draw. We're going to look at some more early exchanges and fourth move alternatives to black. First game is Daniel Campora, Argentinian Grandmaster, against Alvarez. This was played in Spain, 1999. So, e4, pawn takes, knight takes, and as we saw in a few earlier games, the exchange on d4. Knight takes d4, queen takes d4. But, previously we saw games where black played queen f6 and offered trade queens. Here, we're going to look at passive play by black, where he just plays d6. Well, what should white do? One option would be to play c4 and establish kind of a rock to bind type formation. Another option is straightforward development with knight c3. Bishop d7, bishop f4, knight e7, and castles. You can see white is going for very rapid development. Black plays knight c6, queen comes back to e3, and black plays pawn to f6. Clearly, He's trying to prevent white from ramming the pawn into e5. But now comes king b1. And black plays a6. Clearly, he's trying to create a defensive fortress along the third rank. However, such a passive approach is doomed versus a good grandmaster. As Tarash said, cramped positions carry within them the germ of defeat. White enjoys more space, a lead in development, and superior mobility. Thus, he will be able to decide which side of the chessboard he wants to attack on. I really like the way Campora handles this. First, he launches the h-pawn, gaining space on the king side. After bishop e6, all the way to h5, zap. I call this the zig-swinging advance of pawns. By gaining more space on the king side, white makes kingside castling an unpleasant choice for black. Therefore, black plays queen d7, and then on knight d5, options to castle queenside. But now, showing superior mobility, Campora swings over to the attack. Other options would be h6, g5, bishop back, and then on bishop e7, bishop c4, again with a very clear edge for white, or simply a3, and then on rook e8, g3. And then on f5, bishop g2 takes, and knight takes, bishop takes. Again, offering white a clear advantage. But with queen a3, white's threat is not so subtle. In fact, it's a bit blunt. Just bishop a6, b a6, queen a6 check, and rook lift. After bishop takes b5, pawn takes, knight b4 with a fork, rook b3 with a pin, c5, pawn takes, queen a7, rook b4 check, queen takes, and then the second rook comes to h3, d5, and rook a3 mate. So in short, queen a3 offers a very attractive threat of simply bishop takes a6 with a brute force mating attack against the black king. So after queen a3, Black played knight to b8. Kind of backward development, if you will, but he has to do something about the threat on a6. But now white continued development, and after bishop e7, played rook d3 exclamation point. Now, of course, if white is interested in a theoretical advantage, he could play knight takes e7, securing the bishop pair. But rook d3 has a more sinister plot in mind. After bishop d5, he takes b5, and white has close to winning advantage. More space, safer king, bishop pair, superior mobility. Strategically, we could probably say white is winning, but as Anatoly Karpov pointed out, no matter how well you play strategically, there always comes a tactical crescendo at some moment. After rook d8, rook b3, continuing the commitment to attacking the black king. Black hunkers down with bishop b8. Notice that queen f5 could be met by queen b4. And a typical variation like this could possibly happen. So rook to b3, 
black plays bishop d8. But then comes queen b4, threatening mate in one. Black plays c5. Well, with the bishops, you definitely want to open the position and try to expose the black king. Knight c6, queen d2, and now black should play bishop to c7 and defend the pawn on d6. However, rook d1, b5, bishop f3, bishop d4, queen f4, rook e5, and h6 would offer white a winning initiative. So in this position, black bailed out, played rook takes e2, queen takes e2, bishop c7, and this is probably where he was disappointed to find that knight d4 would not recover the exchange because of queen c4 check. And on knight c6, queen d5, followed by rook e1, would just be a very simple technical win for the white. Against some easy variation, we're going to take a look at five knight takes c6, b takes c6, and then six bishop to d3 instead of the more aggressive six e5. Bishop to d3 guards the white pawn on e4, prepares the castle kingside. The first game in this respect will be Chernyshev versus Victor Portnoy from Warsaw, 2002, where Victor sacrificed the pawn, got the two bishops, and managed to struggle to a draw. The next game will be Chernyshov versus Kamatagaliev from Slovakia 2000, where Black reached a probably drawn two rook and bishop versus two rook and bishop opposite color endgame. However, Chernyshov's play shows the practical possibilities for the white player when Black has damaged pawn. Then we will look at Zadima versus Mikhailovsky, white one in 27 moves. We will look at Mekha versus Gamesi, where White definitely had tremendous attacking opportunities, but the game ended in a draw. Then we will look at a game I had against Mr. Jones, Online Blitz 2016, where I managed to win in 36 moves, and the game Koss versus Borisek from Slovenia 2000, where White prevailed in 30 moves. The first game we are going to look at in the 6 Bishop D3 system of the Nisi variation will be Chernyshev versus Korshnoi, Warsaw, 2002. Let's take a look. d 45 knight out. Knight out, sending the pawn, d4, discuss game, takes, knight takes, and then knight f6. Here, knight takes c6, b takes c6, and of course, our main move will be d5, attacking the knight immediately. However, an excellent alternative and logical backup system is simply bishop d3. Defending the pawn on e4, preparing for rapid castle kingside. Now, black plays d5. Very logical. Immediately strikes out against the white center. And castles. White's best try for an advantage. And now, fortunately, played very sharp bishop to g4. Against d takes e4, the key idea to remember for white is that you have to play queen e1. Then, on queen e7, you need to play queen to c3, and we will see a few games like that. The point is, we can take the bishop on d3, obviously, because of queen c6 check. We will see a few games like that in a little bit. After castles, Portnoy played bishop to g4. And now, f3 would be a mistake, because d takes e4, queen e1, bishop e6, and after pawn takes, Knight to g4, h3, queen check, and h5 offers black pretty active play. So after bishop g4, white played queen e1. So after queen e1, black simply develops with bishop e7, and then white played queen to e3, attacking e6. Of course, e5 attacking the knight would have also been 
pretty logical. Queen c3, castles, and then e5 attacking. Knight went to d7, h3 attacking the bishop, and f4. You can see white has done a good job of getting his center pawns rolling. Black now played e4 and sacrificed the e6 pawn. But let's take a look. Suppose he played c5. Then white can play f5, quasi trapping the bishop on e6. After d4, white has the very nice retreat, queen back to d2. And when the bishop saves itself with bishop to d5, f6 does a great job of rolling the pawn. After pawn takes, the point of queen d2 is to have the invasion with queen h6, and after f5, bishop takes f5, we can see the black king is in a main net. For example, rook e8, check, king f8, and queen h8, mate. So that's why, after white played f4, fortunately decided it was time to sacrifice a pawn and play d4, allowing white to take on c6. Of course, it goes without saying, the queen takes d4, bishop c5 would not be the proper way to handle the position for white. And back to the game, queen c6, now black plays knight to c5, chasing white's light squared bishop. Queen retreated to f3, bishop went to d5, queen e2, and then knight takes e3, c takes d3. So, white has managed to secure an extra pawn, but black has two bishops as compensation. Black now played f6, shipping away at the white spearhead pawn. Well, white needs to get this queen side developed, so knight d2. f takes e5, f takes e5. And white does have a pass pawn, but fortunately immediately blockades with queen d7. And after knight f3, then he plays rook f5. Probably the best way for black to play would be rook e8, with full compensation. After rook f5, then came bishop d2, rook at a to f8. And here, white made a very interesting practical decision. He played e6, jettisoning the pawn. Fortunately, declined the pawn with queen d6, but let's take a look. If queen e6, white trades queen and then takes advantage of the two bishops being lined up on file. If king f7, then g4, knight check, and knight takes e6, wins for white. Let's take another look. If queen e6, trade queen, rook e1, well, suppose you play rook f6. But then would come bishop g5, rook back, bishop takes, with advantage for white. Black should have considered playing bishop takes on e6. So then he can meet rook at a to e1 with rook f6. And bishop g5 can be met with rook f7. And then if the bishop takes, rook takes, queen to e5, he has the simple retreat, rook back, and trade rooks, bishop f7, and Bishop takes a2 with a drawn sight. But in the game after e6, Portnoy didn't want a liquidation and the probable draw, he played queen d6. But then came knight d4. Rook f1, rook f1. All the rooks came off, queen takes, and then bishop f6 attacking the knight. The knight went to f5, he recovers the e6 pawn, and we can see the two bishops are attacking the two white pawns on the queen side. Therefore, black plays c3, but now comes queen c6, and the queen prepares to penetrate to c2. After bishop e3, king c2, bishop e4, the bishops come off, knight takes, and queen takes a2, and the position is pretty much equal. So now the position is equal, but white sets a trap. He plays knight f5. And here, Black could play king h8 if he wants to try and continue play. In the game, fortunately played queen a3. But, probably, it would have been safe enough to simply quote, fall into the trap and allow knight e7 check, king h8, queen f8 check, and just simply play bishop back to d8. On d4, preparing to play d5, 
you can play queen back to f7. And then on queen d8, you can run with the a pawn a5, queen c7, and a4, and that should be pretty easily enough. For when we build our opening repertoire, and we put, well, the open, opening repertoire I recommend for white is with e4 first move. And uh, uh, quite frequently you will see e5 move. Maybe same amount of times as, same number of times as you're going to see c5. So e5 is very imp big chapter in our opening preparation for white. So on e4, e5, I recommend uh, Scotch Gambit or Two Knights Defense, whatever, you know, different uh, publications, they call it differently. And also, um, of course, Gioco Piano, because that's the opening you cannot do without, because it's up to black to play after knight f3, knight c6, next move bishop c5, and then it will be Gioco Piano. So the move order I recommend here to get to um, Scotch Gambit or to knight defense that I was talking about now is d4, e takes d, and bishop c4. That's where the deviation between two knights defense, which is knight f6, and scotch, and uh, gioco piano, bishop c5 begins. Now, let's talk about these two openings. Now, before we get to one big chapter, or second big chapter, let's talk about all the other moves. All the other moves are much weaker. Let's get them out of the way. There is move bishop to e7, not recommended for black, and the best respond for white is c3. Now after c3, uh, black has choices to take on c3, to push d3, or to play knight f6. Now, if black plays d3, then they quickly get very bad, maybe lost position. After queen to b3, attacking f7's pawn, which cannot be protected. Well, for example, if black goes knight a5, bishop takes f7, king f8, and queen a4. Now you can see that if black takes white's bishop, white is going to take knight on a5, now black's king is not castled, and also d3 pawn is practically... In scotch, we every day, or maybe every few days, we see something new, especially when I play some blitz games on, on the internet, or I analyze, I come up with something new. Now, we cannot, we couldn't possibly cover everything on the previous DVDs, but we covered most of the main continuations. What we want to see now, what will happen if black tries something new? And I mentioned many times the many different continuations for black. We can't possibly cover not in two hour DVD on 10 hour DVDs. But I want to bring you some examples and that you can see how we deal with various unexpected continuations. And in this case, unexpected continuations been played by fairly strong players. They tried to derail white from main continuations and try to um, get good positions by doing it. Well, let's see what happened here. Bishop c4, knight f6, e5, d5, bishop b5. Of course, we very well know that the main 
move here is knight e4 and there is no secret about it but I mention also that on knight d7 we should castle and that's what happened in one of the games uh, white castled, black went bishop e7, we went rook e1, black castled, white went knight d2, and all of a sudden black here played knight to c5. Now, how we deal with it? We play bishop takes c6, pawn takes c6, and knight takes d4. That's exactly, that's exactly what happened in Hello, my name is Roman Jindhashvili and the purpose of this DVD there will be no theoretical discussions there will be no discussions about uh, what is the best move in the opening. We already done that part. Now we go to practical part of playing these openings. Now, I am going to show you some of the games, but most of them been played by me, on the openings that we very well analyzed in a theoretical part, in a, th on a theoretical DVD. Now, these games will bring you, they are carefully selected, very typical play in the opening we're going to discuss. Very typical, something that you may dis be expecting from average player to a strong player. They may not be the best games because the way I've been selecting games from the hundreds and hundreds of different games played by different players, I selected ones that, are that best, uh, that show you the best ideas at work. So what you may be expecting from opponent, what you may be playing, and they are most common uh, thing that may happen in your game. So, again, they are not the best games, they are not the brilliant games, but they are very common and they should be extremely helpful and extremely instructive. So, let's get to it. So the games we're going to be discussing today, they are very typical games for uh, two knights defense or scotch gambit, the way you want to call it, one particular type of positions, which is the main position and main continuation of this opening, d4 ed. Bishop c4. Bishop c4 can be played first and then d4, which will make no difference. Knight f6, e5. And here I would like to discuss the main continuation, d5. Because this is the most popular. You will probably get it 9 out of 10 times. Although there are moves like knight e4 or knight g4. Also very playable. D5, bishop B5, knight E4, knight takes D4. And this is the position we're going to look um, at the games for. So, knight takes D4. There are two moves now for uh, black. There are bishop C5 or bishop D7. And uh, let's look at the move that was played in this game, in the first game. We're going to analyze this bishop c5. Bishop e3. Bishop d7. Bishop takes c6. B takes c. And knight d2. 
Uh, in the game, my opponent played bishop takes d4. Well, the only other move is knight takes d2 because castling is real bad in this position because knight takes e4, d takes c, and knight takes c6, winning a pawn, and also queen e7 is very bad because knight takes e4, d takes e, and e6. This is all discussed and analyzed on the theoretical DVD of on this opening. So,